shaft because of the Thank you. 
of hard talking. Okay. Um, if I can find my glasses. So. <laughs> It's the next move. Ah. Hey. <laughs> Were you bored this morning? Okay. Right. Okay. Um, yes, we are in a lovely space, a fantastic space, um, Reining House. Um, but as many other spaces and spaces all the time, we should start in the beginning and, 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 and actually ask ourselves what we are trying to do. And of course, we're trying to make this space into a place. And it's not exactly the same thing. Spaces are easy. Architecture is the definition of space, basically. So it's, e it's relatively easy to define space. But without meaning, it doesn't become a place. So how do we give space meaning? And from individual meaning, and we do that by experiencing space, experiencing something happening in that space, either a dialogue or hearing something or listening or doing something. That is giving it meaning. We remember it. It has a place. It has a definition. It becomes unique. It becomes part of us. It becomes part of us. And how then does that place become community, which means a common place? How does that sense of individuality, ownership, or um, being in a place, become a communal, th communal act. And it's not an easy transition. It means we have to agree on the essence of this space, agree on the name, agree on the values, agree on the function, on the role of this. What are we together? What is our function in the city? And the interesting thing about places like this, of which there are many in Europe, the post-industrial space, this kind of no man's land in a way, but it's a process of transition. But the transition is not just here, because it is, as has been said, a major development. You cannot just relocate or attract 15,000 people and the city of Graz carry on as normal. It will tip. It will tip because this is the card that Graz is playing on which the future is written. This is a statement about what is leading the city into the future. This is its values. This is, it becomes all of, all of a sudden very transparent about what the ambitions of this city are. So it's not just a quarter. It's not just an add-on. It is changing the city inside out. So that's more important. You have to gather all the forces of the city, all the positive forces, and take all the confrontations which are necessary to work through a process to define that, because by doing that, you're defining the future of grants. Oh, this is going to take longer than I thought, actually. Um, I had an, uh, we'll see how far we get. But as Charles Landry says, and Charles Landry, for anybody who's working in urbanism, probably knows, wrote the definitive book, The Creative City, in about 2000. Well, I said, I found out, I, I said to him, I found the concept, and he disregarded that apparently. But anyway, he wrote the book, and that's what counts. He said, we cannot build or even rebuild the city. We have to create or recreate the city. So, of course, it depends on exactly what you said. What is the city? In what terms do we describe the city? And Landry says that we have lost, or we have to, we have to guard the qualities of urbanity, and they must be protected and also increased intensity variation, density, experiences, 
freedom, chance, participation, social mix, creativity, knowledge, interculturality. But how do we plan for these? How do we plan for these? And at the best, at their best, great cities are great, creative, livable, self-sustaining places. Places of anchorage, places of possibility, places of connection and networking, places of self-realization, and places of inspiration. Those are, you might say, the, the goals of any, any city. There has been the last, like, well, I don't know, you can go back 20, 30 years, but particularly the last 15 years, um, a, a hard discussion on the new approaches we need to thinking about the city and redefining the city. And then from a point of view of, um, of urbanism, we're drawing right back now and taking an overview. Um, and if I'm harsh on architects, it's because I think um, we're a small team and you're a big team. So, you know, when we're in there, we kick hard. So from the failures of traditional planning and urbanism, of which we don't have to write any more books about, but there is a feeling of increasing segregation and friction in the urban cities. There is a documented decline of public life in spaces over 50 years. In the Nordic countries, we've measured that the, the, the amount of time people use in public space hit a low at about five years ago and was 25% of the 1940s. So it shows that people don't have to go to the public squares anymore because they have shopping malls, because they have cars, because they have uh, convenient uh, sports centers, uh, and so on and so on, and now because they have online shopping and whatever. So the need to go into the public square and be part of the city is not there. We're not forced to. We have to want to. We have to desire it. There has to be something which attracts us and makes us move. We have to change our daily life to go to the city to experience something. It's a completely different parameter. There's also the increased fascination of what we call the urban. We are all urban. We're all actually globally urban. And how this notion then becomes the performative city. Cities are performing. They're performing on the international scale. They're attracting things which show they perform, show their power, show their intelligence, show their greenness. They have events which are in the performative city. But we also see the city as a stage for the individual. The urban space is a stage for the individual and communities. And there are policies of instant architecture, temporary preparatory processes in urban regeneration work. The New York Times celebrated the fact that the United States in the uh, architectural Venice um, Biennale had, had instant urbanism as its theme. Instant urbanism, said the New York Times, is a permanent condition. Instant urbanism is a permanent condition. Why do we still talking about, talk about temporary and permanent? In planning terms, permanent, there is no permanence. Some are more or less temporary than others. Everything has a sell-by date. Actually, we are not in the same town or name city as we were 400 years ago. So in a way, this idea of permanence and temporariness is something we have to look. And we've all noted the success of culture as a reviver of cities and an attraction. From the point of view of citizenship, there is a general, you might say, a growing lack of trust in political leadership. There's increased corruption in Europe. There's increased political extremism. And um, a counter to that, there is increased activism and protest movements, which are not, which are all basically on the street. These are street movements. These are, you might say, grassroots movements. So they're not formalized political processes. They're alternative processes. They are online communities and so on. So we need to find new models of citizenship to re-engage citizens and to get reshare the, the responsibility between cities, i.e. local authorities, and civil society. These have to be negotiated in a new way, otherwise our system cannot be sustainable in the future. And we have become increased, uh, we have an increase in awareness of the social divisions in urban society. There is also a huge, you might say, uh, wave in which 
um, in which uh, the digital and social technologies, social media, have also increased our ability and, and uh, ability to co-create. This is also then transferred to other sectors. So this is learning us how to co-create and how to work in another way. And this has to be then looked at from a city planning point of view as well. From an artistic practice, the artists are re-engaging, particularly since 2000, particularly also since the, the havoc of the 2008, you might say, where both the climate crisis, the financial crisis, and various riots in cities and so on, have stimulated the fact that artists have a, a new agenda. They're not anymore distancing themselves from the society. They're asking how can they contribute to society. They're not trying to, might say, make a point of just criticizing, but also finding solutions. These are new movements, and particularly young generations of artists are not distancing at all. They want to re-engage with society. It's also a way of finding a new artistic format after the endless wanderings in postmodernism, which really didn't get us anywhere. So artists are often working in, as individuals in new artistic collaborations, performing arts, urbanists, media, often work together. And actually, art as an a object has almost ceased to exist. Art is artistic practice, artistic communities, artistic processes. So we're talking about art in very, very different ways. And it's also searching after a new aesthetic platform. Street arts have grown up, professionalism, capacity development, and so on. And that's part of what you might say in situ is. And there is new, the lucrative media, the social media, which adds another layer and makes the fact that no more um, form does not follow function. As architects used to say, form follows fiction more and more. Um, so this is another reality giving another way of looking at how you plan spaces and functions. They don't have to always fit together. And anyway, we're talking about hybrid functions and hybrid spaces and places. So Landry says, we need a reflexive cultural planning, which at one and the same time takes into account the various differences in lifestyles and the need for free space and dialogue. The challenge of planning lies in the mobilization of the city's own resources instead of mindlessly copying models and concepts which have been developed elsewhere. And if we look at how, you might say, the arts have been planned and, and connect with the city, we can see four sort of variations in how this is usually done. This is done. There's a somewhat also a timeline. You might say planning for the arts is something born from the 60s and 70s, the provision of arts facilities and arts infrastructure. Then came the wave of iconic architecture and iconic cultural events, which were supposed to turn cities around in one neat grasp. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Then there's the creative cities approach, which looked at the emerging, you might say, new um, industries of emerging industries of, of design, <clears throat> of fashion, of architecture and so on, of music, and looked at this whole clustering of the creative class and this whole creative cities jargon. And there is cultural... ...a movement towards arts policies seem to be a bit defunct now. There are very few cities which look, which look at their arts provision and arts policy just as being a, a segment on its own. There are some who still hype the creative cities uh, concept, but more and more the ethos of a, what you call cultural planning seems to be grounding, not only in places like the United States and Britain, Canada, Australia, but also many European countries and particularly the Nordic countries where I happen to be working. So they were talking about planning with culture, not planning for culture. We're talking about planning for diverse lifestyles and subcultures. We're looking at cities as local spaces, local spaces. We have a broad anthropological definition of culture, creativity as local resources, and strategic use of culture and community development. Franco Bianchini, who is a professor in Leeds of urban planning, um, and one of the founders of this cultural planning ethos, proposes that the political mandate for culture is constantly changing. 
and that now we are moving definitively from a planned to an activist, sorry, an activist culture. Planned to an activist culture. And this must be reflected in our planning models. He talks about destabilizing and deconstructing our planning models to take account of this. How do we do that without chaos? How do we do that without creating opposition and friction? So relating to the trends mentioned above, he advocates that cultural policy and strategies must take account of current challenges. So these are more complex and involving situations require a more integrated, more adjustable planning and organization. And what is this, uh, this phenomenon called uh, cultural planning? It's a sort of an alternative to the traditional planning theory initiated in the late 80s, but only now it's, might you say, it's come into fashion because the time is right. Basically, it's a humanistic approach, integrated, flexible, and a democratic. And in this concept of cultural planning, the notion of cultural state is a broad, defining framework, and all, in fact, all-encompassing attempt to look at the city as a cultural phenomena, the city as a cultural phenomena. And cultural phenomena are characterized by fluid, interactive, developmental, and in constant communication. The city as a cultural phenomena is thus not just the infrastructure, but also the values, the beliefs, the traditions, the symbols, the stories, the people and the skills, the processes, the networks, and the communications of the city. And that's damn complicated. So, cultural planning can secure flexibility, short-term and temporary situations in a global urban context, where change is the normal status quo. Change is constant. Cultural planning is about increasing participation in cities to counter cultural division, divisions by function, and differences in status. It, what Richard Sennett, the great American sociologist, has called uh, the divided city or the segregated city, which we have built during the 20th century. And if you look at, uh, so you see, you might see cultural policy is about five E's. And you can't choose one, you have to choose them all. The things which are demanded now politically by cultural policy are enlightenment, economic impact, environment, empowerment, and entertainment. Those are the five things which people now expect delivered via cultural policy and strategy. And in fact, you might say what we're talking about is that culture is not a sector, but culture is somehow permeating and involved in all these sectors and in an aspect of it. And arts, of course, is at the core of that. So it's complex, multi-layered, change in dynamic, interrelated urban societies require more integrated analysis and management. And that was by Saskia Sassens, who happens to be the wife of the former Richard Sennett, um, and who wrote the book, um, wrote the book, Ch -ch -ch -ch, The Digital City, and um, has, is maybe the most authoritative person on uh, globalized cities. Um, I think I'll skip that. It's too complicated. Um, um, if we're looking at processes of um, uh, cultural planning, it usually has this sort of scenario. There's a political mandate, and I've put times on here because it was the, a, a large project I did for the city of Aarhus in its preparation for the cultural capital and a region. So it's quite a large area of 1.3 um, uh, million people. Um, and these are the time frames it, 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 it required. But um, of course, these can be um, shortened. But just to give you an idea, a political mandate then is the most key, key aspect of this new approach is this cultural mapping, which can be very, um, very intricate using different methods. Then from the mapping, of course, allowing people to develop visions and comment on visions and their own visions and community visions. And from that, develop prototypes for workshops, one-on-one -on -one projects, and then perhaps proposals. So those are the sort of time frames. And if you're looking at the thing about cultural mapping and each between each phase, there's usually a feedback to both participants, which you might say can be partners and citizens, and to the stakeholders, councils and boards. That's a kind of typical process of this socially driven, you might say, planning process. And if we look at cultural mapping, what that might include 
in such an exercise is again taking a concrete example of Aarhus. It was uh, the first workshop with 176 participants defined 10 themes and that defined 22 uh, other, um, you might say, um, uh, neighborhoods. So from the themes we went to 22 neighborhoods and then we actually created some mapping projects and there were 40 to 50 individual mapping projects of all types. Then there was a presentation and documentation. So it's a quite an involved process, but it, it gives not only information, it uh, engages people, and it also gives authority and consensus, and it presents you with ideas and proposals one would never otherwise have got. Uh, and we did that. Um, basically, the, 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 you might say the constant factor was a mobile glass container which was put up in various parts of the city, and that was a kind of mobile think tank. So it was important to visualize this open door policy and not just expect people to come, but also engage them in their surroundings and their environment and so on. So it became a sort of a, a common workspace. If we're looking at, um, if we're looking at, um, I won't go into that anyway. No, no, All right. Um, so what are the links between artistic action and urban change? But actually in itself, artistic action, cultural action is urban change. Public space is the meeting point of urban society and thus the key to many issues. Urban, social, environmental strategies and agendas often start there. But the first thing is it can help build a new identity. It can help create an awareness of the city and increase sense of identity and ownership based on authentic personal experience, artistic events, conceptual art, urban rituals, and so on. It can help to develop the, the ability to vision, to vision, to, um, to dream, the, the ability to develop narratives which can help people conceive of future lifestyles, social structures, role-playing, visualization. It can lead to a new appreciation of the city. It can take people to unknown sites, places, making hidden aspects of the city public, expanding citizens' awareness of the city. It can highlight qualities of the city or the neighborhoods which might be lost or which could be used or the lack of. It can give new vantage points, access to closed buildings, rooftop views, and so on. It can address stigmatized places and communities which are perceived at, 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 who's gonna finish that? At, 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 at a loss of, <laughs> or whatever. Um, <clears throat> And it can reappropriate uh, public space, questioning accessibility, openness, ownership, privatization, commercialization of the public space, and so on. It can enable public action and activity as a legitimate, necessary part of social urban development. And it can support design processes of urban spaces, exploring concrete formats, testing events, projects, prototypes in urban space. So the urban space becomes at the, car, at the core of any, you might say, uh, arts strategy which might be relevant for the future city. And the public space is there where agendas collide. And it's become actually someone, you said it yesterday, the gentleman in the front row, the living room of our communities. You said it yesterday. And it's more than the living room. Um, it is also the back room, it's also the kitchen, it's also the greenhouse, it's also whatever of our uh, urban life. It's there where we want to perform for each other and show each other what to do. And this, um, so it's where new urban strategies and greening strategies meet, attracting tourism, searching for new artistic arenas, more urban life and social life, revival of the street as political arena for protest, media, searching for new audiences, and so on and so on. So this seems to be the crux. The question is, does one define a place like this as an urban space? Or is it a private area for a private development? I think that's one of the issues we would like to talk about. Engaging the community, it can give platforms for reflection, involvement, empowerment, relating to local stories, involving communities in research and material, etc. It gives them a vehicle to actually play, play with and it gives them uh, knowledge and systems to use. It can investigate the 
potential of communities and gather material in the processes of change, cultural mapping. It can create urban rituals. I think the fact that uh, artists are incredibly good at communicating and incredibly good at visioning and able to relate to, on the one hand, people's reality and daily life, and on the other hand, maintain a, um, a visionary approach is that which allows them to the community, and they have credibility. I think they're one of the, first, the few groups in society who can still claim to have credibility um, intact. And they can also, of course, you be used strategically, be used in inverted commas, which is sometimes the case, but uh, also they can use themselves in cultural, you might say, strategic actions, exploring in what you call liminal zones of conflict. Um, and I think this is important because if you play out conflicts in a cultural arena, um, it's positive. If you play them out in a political or a religious or an economic arena, they can be um, very uh, disastrous. So playing out the scenarios of conflict in any society in a cultural situation, which is what people do on the stage basically, um, is a good thing. But if you can actually extend that to working with with whole societies that and working not just role playing but having people actually enact that it becomes very very powerful so issues of intercultural conflict issues of social exclusion generational issues can be addressed and it develops cultural fora and networks which are sustainable and which use cultural events and so on ongoing support and it creates an awareness of the decision makers artists are very good at putting things very specifically and concretely on the line that can be understood. They were very good at being critical in a, in a, in a positive way. Um, critical because it's not just coming with the good ideas, but also shouting in protest. And that's very important that there is a voice which needs to be heard. And it's a voice which hopefully reflects what has usually been forgotten. And they can support ongoing urban processes by being institutions or activities rooted in a um, place. Professor Bishop from the, has written a book called The Contemporary City. He was um, the former mayor of London's uh, head of design. They made him into the, uh, they made a design um, uh, uh, section uh, to look at the overall design of the city of London and his conclusions were to talk about the contemporary, the temporary city. London was losing its sense of temporary. Everything was being regulated, everything was, was, was being developed, and it was financed that it was ruining the city. So he talked about what have urbanists been so focused on permanence? What changes are driving temporary urbanism? Are temporary uses a manifestation of a more dynamic, flexible, adaptive urbanism? If so, how should our planning processes be adapted? So he looked at the idea of the temporary is not just the idea of a one night stand. Of course, they are positive forces of change, delight and inspires, challenge parameters, act of hope, act of defiance, and so on and so on. And the pop up, and in Paris, and farmers markets, and in Detroit. And he talks very much about the need to have curate, stimulate. This was his design brief curate, stimulate, design, manage. It was the curate, stimulate that was missing. They'd always had the manage and design, but he wanted to curate and stimulate. And he saw the link between the temporary and the permanent, not as the top section, where the temporary, it may be artists, it may be communities that just do something and then are, have to move on because the permanent is in place, financed. But he actually saw it as two linked processes. The temporary may become permanent, the permanent may be just temporary, the one feeds the other, and you get a far more integrated system. And we have to look at possibilities like that. And there is also zones of tolerance. He talked about zones of tolerance, where we could try out things. And you can see the, the scale of the art and the scale of the reality. But actually, it's the just, juxtaposition, it's the difference, which actually creates the tension and gives the room for negotiation and not just things which are like the real. So another example of working in a very different way is um, um, Kirsten Bergendahl, who worked with, for five years with, um, with a uh, housing estate in Sweden. She was appointed as, the, uh, as an artist in residence for five years and was given um, the powers of what usually is given 
to the manager of Urban Regeneration Project. So she was actually able to, as an artist, control regeneration. And um, it was a very, very different process, um, but a very uh, fruitful process, working out how to do that. Um, the other, the, another, another Nordic uh, design company has, uh, has always worked with very, very complicated urban issues and make analyses. But on the side, they always do one thing before they start. They build. They build in a space where people can see them build that the architect, architects have not yet forgotten how to use a saw, how to use a hammer, how to construct something and invite people in. So actually, they are working in the community and not just designing for builders who build for the community. So this acceptance of having to build a common platform is taken very literally that you find that this then is, in, is the first facility they provide in those planning processes. It has to be something new. It has to be something shoddy and make-believe and so on. Very easy stuff, but it's very, very important. Um, then there's a, a, a project like, am I going to do this? Yeah, 10. Uh, 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 uh. Then there's a project between <laughs> landscape and body. And this is the city of Kur, which has uh, allocated 100 million, which is 15 million euros to inviting artists to work in a pre-development process. They have stopped the development of the area for three years so that the three years can be used for creating projects which are run by artists and architects and designers together to find models for the future. They have in a way deferred the permanent and hope that the practical processes will generate where they look very much at the materials and very much at the, the views and very much at the, uh, you might say, the work that, to inspire the artists. So the artists are working alongside the, uh, the architects who have a, are paid three years to lie dormant and not to design, but to actually follow the processes. So that is another strategy which is, which is taking off. The Roskilde Festival is a festival of 40,000 people. And uh, the Roskilde Festival is so important for the festival and has created such wonderful experience. It is a temporary city for five days. So the politician decided to use the experience of a temporary city for five days over 30 years to build their new city. So they invited the festival to actually take charge of the new development of this space, which is very much like this space here, and give them architects and designers and engineers to work with and develop something. And they have wonderful designers of their own, and they build, con they build constructions which are, of course, ephemeral. They last five days, but it's the same vision which drives. So uh, they have 78,000 paying guests at this festival, and they have lots of experience of how to create communities, how to create a sense of belonging. So this is a very radical idea of how you might... Uh, 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 uh. It's not even going fast enough. No. I'm trying to skip. Uh, come on. Right, okay. So plan as little as possible, as much as necessary. This is their... This is their <laughs> The plan is the result of actions, negotiations and projects. The leaf possibility is open for further development. Democracy is not only formal, but becomes live and through openness and participation in a continuous qualifying process. Support the actions in the city rather than regulate from a distance. Create an atmosphere where actions are appreciated and then claim is not always consensus. Aesthetic are, aesthetics are formed through activities and hybrid spaces of oppositions in homogeneity, aspiration, disorder and unfinishedness. Create a sense of the potential of the place and show urbanity. So that is the official framework for designing a city for 20,000 people. Um, a professor of uh, planning in Utah University called Nan Ellen talks about the city in flow, integral urbanism for a new era. And the last decade we've talked about, um, and we've talked about that. But she talks about integral urbanism, hybridity, connectivity, porosity, authenticity, vulnerability as the five qualities of the city of the future. Hybridity is escaping from fixed typologies. Connecting is, we can work it out. Porosity preserves the integrity of the action and allows access. Authenticity draws in identities and material from social, cultural, urban. The result is a city in flow. 
Flow is the intense experience between boredom and overstimulation, immersion, awareness, sense of harmony, meaning, and being well. Integral urbanism veers away from master planning and proposes more punctual interventions that have a tentacle effect or a domino effect. This is a key to a new kind of cultural urbanism, which is ecological and cultural in its way of thinking. Urban cultural planning for the post-crisis and the 21st century. And she says, such places are not planned, they are conceived, nurtured, programmed, choreographed. So, last series. Placemaking, pop-up architecture, and all the rest of the stuff you can see there are things which are in our vocabulary, but which are neither planning nor art, or they're planning and architecture and art. They're in-betweens, they're both or, they're both. So we actually have a new hybridity. We actually have a meeting place, which is not any statutory, you might say, process, but which has come from the grassroots, which has come from young architects and artists, and which is defined by the need of the times where planning and artistic methods overlap, collide, and possibly interweave a new language. So what does one need for an approach like this to work in a place like this? One needs a time frame for transition and an incremental approach. Perhaps no deadlines, perhaps no time scale where things are finished, things are never finished. One needs a balanced power structure where developers, the city, and users have a framework perhaps like the framework there is in Holland, where they have three-part agreements between the developers, the cultural sector, the users, and the, um, the community, and uh, the developers. And these are often for 15 years, in which the city goes in and guarantees the rents and guarantees the, the control of the space. So developers are able and willing to let people in um, their um, structures. Informal relationships must be supported within a protective framework. It's impossible to do things like this in a formal uh, framework alone, but they can provide a protection, an outer skin for the informal relationships. And a financial framework which is not too demanding, i.e. long-term investment, public and private investment, finding who takes responsibility for what. And the resources and willingness to allow for a period of mapping, testing, gathering information, and sensing. Sensing using film and so on and so on. A period of visioning where mobile intimistic structures and events can also give the project appeal, communicate, and give hands-on processes. The new neighborhood is not an extension of the city, but also should change the city itself. We mentioned that. So this, what might be, or what is the DNA of this place? Where to start? Let's forget past, present, future, and develop memory, sensing, fiction. Form does not fo follow function anymore. Form follows fiction. Let's start with places of imagination rooted in reality. Let's rethink the grass. And for God's sake, don't make a city park like that. Thank you. Okay.